thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm Jeremy McCarter. That is Thomas Kale, uh, the justly celebrated director of Hamilton. Uh, just so I understand, we both understand um, um, who we're spending our evening with, I would love to know. Um, it's kind of hard to see. Oh, that's better. Uh, who, who has seen Hamilton? Wow. Twice. That twice? Three Do I hear times. three times? Three Do times. I hear three? <laughs> Uh, so, and of the people who put your hands up, uh, who saw it in New York? And who saw it, uh, has anyone seen it here yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And, and uh, people who haven't seen it, um, have, who's listened to the album? Who listened, who listened to it today? <laughs> Anybody got it on right now? <laughs> who read Jeremy's book on the way over? <laughs> yeah. That's right. These are my people. Well, we're glad you're with us tonight. Um, uh, I, as Tommy said, I wrote the book with Lynn manuel about the creation of the show, and some of the best conversations that I had in the time that I spent working on that book were with my friend Tommy. Uh, one of the things that I was really privileged to see in the years that I spent around the show were, uh, were all the little choices that went into the creation of this thing that is now this huge phenomenon. And it struck me, there's this paradox about it. You look at Hamilton now, all of you have seen it, or you look at it several times, the show-offs who saw it three times, um, and it looks inevitable. Like, you can't imagine any piece of it being different than it is somehow. Uh, and of course, that's false. It was the product of literally thousands of choices over years about every aspect of what ended up on that stage, and most of those decisions were made by Tommy. And so I thought it would be fun to have a chance to, to go uh, to look at some moments in the creation of the show and try to get a sense of how it is it exactly that this insane idea that Lynn came up with back in 2008 has now made it to the point where, where here we all are uh, on a Monday night um, in Chicago. So let's... This was my plan. <laughs> right. I don't know what you guys were thinking about in 2008, but I was thinking about this. But... But let's start. But let's start in uh, the summer of 2011. Mm. There's a benefit at Ars Nova. Uh, this is a yes. theater company on the west side of Manhattan, uh, and one of the acts performing in that show is Freestyle Love Supreme, um, a freestyle performance company. Tommy directs it. Lynn is in it, and for Lynn's performance that night, uh, he does my shot. You are in the audience that that night. Um, it's, I think, your first interaction with the material from the show in quite that relationship. What is it like when you see that? Well, I thought it was time to get to work. Um, yeah. You know, Lynn had written the song that he did at the White House. Mm -hmm. um, he worked on My Shot for about, you know, 12 months at least. You know, it took him a year to write that song, if not more. And when we were asked to do this benefit at Ars Nova for Freestyle, Freestyle is an improvisational hip hop concert. And it was something that we devised, me, Lynn, and our friend Anthony Viniziali, in 2003, 2004, while I was working on In the Heights. So Heights was this very scripted thing that we were sort of you know, toiling with. And late at night, we would do these completely disposable, working opposing muscle groups, as Lynn says, um, shows, where you set it and then it was gone. And it wasn't recorded and it just, disappeared into the world. Mm -hmm. So freestyle was the, you know, was the ephemeral. And, you know, you're, and then you're trying to like carve this other thing and like uh, allow it to live in, um, in some sort of setting like stone where it will be mm -hmm. um, carried forth and other people will do the show. So Ars Nova, which is this, this really cool theater on 54th Street and uh, 10th on the west side, was where Freestyle of Supreme had started, and a lot of us had kind of come up through there. And we were doing a benefit for Ars Nova where they said, yes, we want Freestyle to perform, but what if all of these really gifted songwriters who happen to be in Freestyle of Supreme, people that the world knows, like Christopher Jackson, um, who plays George Washington, David Diggs was in Freestyle but was not there that night. Um, it was a very untalented group. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so as we were putting this evening together, Lynn said, well, I think I'm gonna do this song that I wrote with another one of my friends, and there's actually, uh, there's, like an, there's an email correspondence I have where Lynn was going to do this other song, which was about, um, well, it was not about the Revolutionary War. <laughs> it was slightly less significant, but very talented. Um, yeah. and, and then at the last minute, we were talking about it, and he said, we said, well, why don't we just use this as a chance to try out my shot? So what I remember is when we were rehearsing the number, Lynn sort of, uh, 
got out too fast on it, and he was really kind of hyped to do it, and we ended up going back and like doing it again, and I said, Lynn, there's nothing an audience likes more than an artist stopping and saying, let's go back to the beginning, because then it's like, oh my god, it's happening now. <laughs> um, <laughs> wait, <laughs> secrets of the trade revealed. <laughs> um, and so he's like, no, no, I got this, I got this. We get to the, like, we get to the event, you know, his, his heart is beating fast, and he comes out too hot, and he stops, and everyone's like, he stopped, and he wrote in the heights. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then he proceeded to do this number, right. and it was the first time that I'd been in a room with an, with an audience experiencing it, and uh, it was chemical. It was just, it was clear that something was happening, mm. and it was in the, you know, in the, the hour after when we were standing upstairs talking, um, you know, eating snacks, where everyone kept on uh, saying nice things to Lynn, which as I've often learned is the best time to get him to work. <laughs> I was like, look how happy they were with your performance. Maybe we should write more songs. Um, and it was, it was at that time where I said, so let's get going. You've written right. two songs in two and a half years. We're like relatively young. Let's, <laughs> let's see what we can do. And um, let's, let's find a place, whether it's Ars Nova or Town Hall or a basement somewhere yeah. and work towards that. But at this point, Lynn is still thinking of this as an album. At this he's, point, he's thinking of it as two songs. Two songs, right. So, yeah, yeah. But he's not, but, but at this point, if I, if I remember right, it's not uh, obvious that the thing that he's working is going to be something that's going to end up on stage. That, that is correct. <laughs> yeah. But you are a director. Uh, Albums yeah, don't yeah. have directors. So what is the, is it, is, it, is it something about your insight into what this thing was ultimately going to turn into? Or is it that your relationship with Lynn was such that whatever shape the thing was going to take, you, the two of you were going to be working on it that way? I think that my job as a director is to be the audience. And I knew I wanted more. And in that way, I'm a, I'm a representative of the people here and the, the people that will ultimately come see any show that I'm working on, whether I'm reading a script or I'm hearing a song. So at that point, there were two of them, and I wanted more. I thought that I knew he had more in him, yeah. and I knew that I could maybe provide some sort of uh, structure and inspiration along the way to give us something to really uh, mold or shape or see what it was because the worst thing that happened is I would help my friend make this album. Right. I would help um, nudge him along or throw some ideas in there that would continue to, to grow this creativity. And the next day, uh, Lynn and I share the same agent, John Bazzetti, who's a person we've worked with for many, many years since In the Heights. And we got on the phone the next day and we said, where can we do this? And it was within a week or so that, uh, that the January 11th of 2012 um, became available. January 11th is a relatively significant day for Alexander Hamilton because he was born then. Um, uh, and we thought, all right, Omen, we get it. <laughs> uh, and the Lincoln Center Songbook Series gave us a slot. And that gave us six months. And so we just, Lynn and I just looked at each other. We said, all right, two songs a month. Let's see what we can do. And when we ended up getting to the Lincoln Center Songbook in, in January 2012, we had an opportunity to have some of our, our, our pals join us on stage. Alex Lackamore, who became our, you know, who obviously was a dear friend of ours, arranger and co-arranger and orchestrator and music director, put together five or six pieces. And instead of, these things are often, this song inspired me, I really always wanted to sing this standard, and we thought, sure, or <laughs> we rented the hall and we're, we have, you know, the, the yeah. hall, by the way, is what was at that time called the Allen Room at the Time Warner Center in New York. It's this unbelievable, I, if you've seen Hamilton three times, you know, but it's this, it's, this, it's this gorgeous room, right? Looks down over Columbus Circle. It's this beautiful glass wall. It sees 450 people or something. And it is, it does tend to kind of have this sort of elegant, you know, everyone show dresses up for it. And then, and and then they invited us. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Fools. And so, you know, I remember saying to, to to the group as we were making uh, you know, the concert and, and putting it together, I just thought, this is probably not the place to do uh, a lot of new material. This is, n this is, no, this is no backers audition. Right. We're throwing a party. Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens when these people come and interact with this music we want to play. And it was that simple. And, and the, the benefit of allowing that first uh, 
movement to be something that was, was not defined by narrative is it meant Link could write whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. So Say No to This from the second act was in that. Mm -hmm. um, the versions of the rap battles were in that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so stuff that was chronologically actually deeper into his life could also be in play. Right. And we didn't feel prohibited from trying to just do the, you know, the first right. part of his life or anything like that. I was there that night. And yes, you were, Jeremy. I, I was there. And, the, and, the, and the, what the Times critic said about it uh, the next day or two days later was absolutely my experience of it. And you could sort of feel it, the energy in the room, like, I don't know what that is up there exactly, but whatever it is is incredible. And I want to see more. Well, you, I mean, well, you and Lynn had, I mean, Lynn had shared some of this early material with you when you were down at the public. That's yeah, right. He, he, when Lynn was first thinking about this stuff, so just, just to sort of set this up a little bit for, so we I met backstage. He seems great. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I first met Lynn um, when I was writing about plays for New York Magazine. Um, I had been writing again and again over the years about how much I wished that more musical theater composers were using hip hop, because I think hip hop is, a, is an exceptionally powerful way of telling stories. Uh, and so in the winter, spring of 2007, uh, I get an invitation to press night of this musical by these people I've, I, I, whose work I don't know, beyond the producers of the show, and within five minutes of going, uh, it was, I felt sure that after years of feeling frustrated and let down by people trying to use hip hop, um, here were people who actually understood um, what it could do, and that was In the Heights, and Tommy directed In the Heights, and Lynn wrote the songs to In the Heights. Um, so anyway, so, so Lynn, the publicist for the show, thought that Lynn and I would hit it off, so he introduced us, and um, in the very first conversation Lynn and I had, he told me about this insane Alexander Hamilton hip hop mixtape idea, um, and then, so then a couple years later in 2011, when I'm on the artistic staff of the Public Theater, then um, part of my job was to bring in artists for my boss, Oscar Eustace, the artistic director, uh, to meet and talk to and see if they can come up with a project or something. And I knew that Lynn had had this idea a couple years earlier. Uh, Oscar at that point, uh, I think was still thinking of you guys as, as pri primarily um, as the people who had won those four Tony Awards in 2008 at the expense of one of Oscar's shows. Um, uh, and I convinced Oscar uh, that um, he, should, he should get past that uh, and that it would be worth having this conversation anyway. And then I emailed Lynn and told him Oscar would be completely thrilled to meet him. Uh, and then in the course of those meetings, that's when I first met you, when, when you came to one of those meetings, and it's when uh, Lynn gave me a demo CD with the first six or seven songs, and I had the same reaction you did, like, I just want to hear more. This sounds incredible. So, so is that Lynn calling? Is he? <laughs> Let me have this, Lynn, okay? <laughs> uh, but, okay, so, but let's go back to Lincoln. Really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things, when, when, I, was, uh, when I was growing up, I, I didn't um, come to theater until a little bit later. Oh, so I started, I started making theater in, in college. Um, and so I was fascinated by the relationship between critics, Brooks Atkinson, Walter Kerr, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, like, sort of the, the first generation, Kenneth Tynan. And there was a relationship that existed between people that were writing about theater and writing critically about theater that still seemed that uh, their, their love for it had not been uh, extinguished mm -hmm. and there was a back and forth and, and that's what I thought could exist. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always the case, but when, when I read the review that, that Jeremy wrote about our show, it, it felt like someone who really understood, who had uh, a similar vocabulary, who had uh, an ability to articulate what we were, what we were trying to express mm -hmm. and it was received. So it was, and I, but yet I did never think, you know, directors and critics aren't hanging out constantly, <laughs> despite what you might hope. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and so when, when Jeremy stopped writing about theater, it felt like, now we can talk. Um, uh, and so this, you know, all of the things in his life that kind of conspired to get him to, um, to that position in the public, yeah. you know, allowed this discourse to happen. But it was, you know, he was someone who existed on that page in New York Magazine, and he, and he wrote about it and mentioned do the right thing and, and, and you know, other cultural references and, and important inspiration for us. And so right. the chance to, to just be able to talk about it out loud was something that was really important for us both. You know, this is the thing, this is, like, I don't think I ever told you this, but one of the reasons why I was, I was able to meet with Lynn for the first time in the summer of 2008, I had already told New York I was leaving to go to Newsweek where I wrote about sort of culture generally. It wasn't just the theater anymore. But one of the reasons why I made that choice, which was perplexing to some, is that 
when you talk about those great critics, one of the things that I think makes a critic um, worth reading um, and worth following is something that um, a, a sort of mentor friend of mine, um, Stanley Kaufman, who was a drama critic for the New York Times, in fact, for a season, um, and for the New Republic for many, many years, and he just passed away at 96, I think. But um, Stanley's approach to criticism was that every critic um, needs to have a touch of John the Baptist or else he ought to quit. <laughs> Meaning, you can't just be reactive. You can't just show up and sort of a, a bounce back an opinion uh, about whatever you've just seen on stage. There ought to be a project, like something bigger, some, some worldview that it, you're connecting to what you're seeing um, night in, night out, week in, week out. Um, and for me, when I decided in the spring of 2008 that I'd had enough of drama criticism after six years doing it and I was ready to move on, a big part of the reason was in the heights, actually. Because I felt like the big, I, I'm not sure that I articulated it quite this clearly to myself, but in, in retrospect, what I was thinking, the specific reason why I was thinking, you know, I've had enough of this, I should go do something else for a while, is that that idea of playing John the Baptist and saying like there ought to be something that you're fighting for, the thing that I wanted to see happen in the theater was musicals that kind of felt like do the right thing. Or th some shows that felt that they were in some direct dialogue with what was going on outside the theater. Musicals that weren't just about musicals. Plays that weren't just about what happens backstage. That had some ambition about trying to reflect the, what's going on in society. I really wanted those to happen, and the hip-hop essays I was writing were a, were a subset of that. And when I thought in the summer of 2008 that look at what's just happened, it was after Heights, it was after Spring Awakening, it was after Passing Strange, there'd been like a good two years, and I thought either I'm about to start repeating myself and wait for the next In the Heights to come along, or I gotta go do something else. So it was really your show, actually, that had a lot to do with the fact that then we could go and start hanging out because <laughs> And once it was up, I kind of felt like I'm not gonna, I hope there's another one of these that comes along, but I don't want to wait. And then, um, and then it turns out the next one that came along was also yours, it was Hamilton. So, <laughs> hello Chicago. <laughs> right. Anyway, long story, I want to go, let's go back to Lincoln Center. Sure. Lincoln Center, Alexander Hamilton's birthday, very exciting night. Now there's, that was the first time I think the audience, uh, the, the public got a look at something that would end up being very distinctive about the way that you approach the cast of the show, is that you were hiring people for these roles, and even then it was just your friends, that did not look like the Founding Fathers. <laughs> Talk a bit about your approach to this. Did you know going in that this was gonna be one of the most distinctive things about the project? No, but it was one of the very earliest conversations I had with Lynn about it. It just never, we, it just never occurred to us that it wouldn't be that. Um, hmm. George Washington was Chris Jackson. And so there's your Rosetta Stone. Um, so anything is possible. Um, and this, you know, this thing that began to emerge from that, this, this notion that we wanted to tell the story of America then, but we wanted to look like America now, mm -hmm. was not something we, we, you know, it was, it's not even, it's deeper than conscious, you know, it's right. deeper than consciousness. It was just, it was, it, it, we were going to do it. We were not going to question it. It, it in fact is the opposite of colorblind. It's, it's very intentionally done. Um, but it was just something that felt that it, it served, um, uh, it, it served whatever our artistic hopes for this project were, right. were about eliminating any distance between the audience and the story. Right. And so this felt like a way for us to, to build a very immediate bridge. But that, there's a paradox in there, because you'd think that the way to, you could, one could make the argument that the way to not have people notice, to, to, to not have it feel that there, uh, there's a sort of mediating filter, is just make them look as much like the actual Founding Fathers as you can. But you guys found that very theatrical way of saying, nope, actually, by reminding you that you're not seeing, we're not going for authenticity, it ends up being somehow more powerful, more direct. Well, we're not going for a historical authenticity there, but what we are doing is reminding um, ourselves and the audience of this very uh, distilled and essential notion, which is that we all came from somewhere, mm -hmm. even the people that looked like that. Right. I grew up in Northern Virginia, in Alexandria, Virginia, 15, 20 minutes from Mount Vernon. You know, I went to soccer camp at uh, the Thomas Jefferson Design University of Virginia. Mm -hmm. You know, James Madison, these people, as I've, uh, you know, sort of grappled with them more recently, mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to describe what it means to grow up in Virginia and what the, the shadows of, of those figures are. I mean, and those shadows also exist as, you know, I went to 
seventh through twelfth grade in D.C. And so when you're driving across Memorial Bridge, you know, and there's that lineup, you know, that Lincoln guy, that Washington thing, <laughs> and then that Capitol, you're like, Mom, drive faster. <laughs> Why do we live in Virginia? <laughs> um, and then, you know, and, and they are both everywhere and then become invisible. Right. And, you know, I, I, uh, I was very, um, I, you know, I was, I was with my, my nephew, who is, is, is now eight years old and was seven at the time, and we were visiting my folks who still live in the D.C. area, and we went to go pick up my sister at Reagan National Airport, and we were driving on the, you know, GW Turnpike right there, and we pull off, and he goes, look, it's the Sea Jack. And he pointed the at the Chris Washington Jackson. Monument. <laughs> and I was like, all right, we're calling Chris. We're telling Chris that we've renamed it. Um, <laughs> you know, so, so why not? Right. Yeah. It is one of the profound things about this whole phenomenon is that you've got a generation of kids now growing up who, when they hear the words George Washington, they actually do think of Chris Jackson's face. That's right. Yeah, yeah. D David Diggs, who played Thomas Jefferson, had a quote in the New York Times, I believe. <laughs> Free subscription for kale. <laughs> I already subscribed. I already subscribed. Um, where he's, you know, where he, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He said, but when I look at currency and it's not Chris, I'm like, what's the matter with this? Right. Right. You know, and, and that's, you know, and so if you do that, then you're just starting to question and investigate. Right. And so, you know, as I, as I meet many very proud parents and lots of these incredible kids that are between the ages of, four and 12. You know, I knew if you were 15 to 18, we might be in your wheelhouse. I didn't know that it was going to be kids that young. What, a lot of these kids memorize by rote, mm -hmm. but there's something else happening here too, where there's a, there's a curiosity which is going behind the what they're saying. And I've started to see it. I start to meet some of these kids. You start to see this, you know, this widespread <laughs> um, YouTube phenomenon of, of kids doing this, um, or people, showing it to me on the street. And I'm like, oh, no, no, you have kids. They're all. Um, <laughs> and then I show them my nephew. And I'm like, oh. Uh, um, but, but, you know, I think about the music that I learned when I was 10 years old. Yeah. It's still somewhere in my brain. Yeah. Um, and it gets packaged in there. I don't know that I was uh, questioning it or it was provoking me. It just was internalized. Maybe something will happen now that this will become some kind of bedrock or foundation, these, these words, these lyrics, these stories. And, uh, and I'm sure we'll get a chance to talk about it with yeah. this, the, the, uh, the education uh, program that, that's in place. The most significant part and the most moving thing is not when these kids come to watch the show, which is hands down, like, you know, the best audience these of that are, week. We should, so yeah. there are these student matinees where the entire audience <laughs> is high school students. Uh, and it's, we're doing this in Chicago and every other city that we're going to be in. And so, and, and the, these performances are part of a curriculum that's been built by the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History. So it's not just you show up and you see a play, you're um, learning about the material ahead of time. And then the part that I think Tommy's going to talk about is that you're actually generating your own work uh, inspired by the show. And this is a group of kids. They're uh, 10th, 11th grade, but mostly 11th graders um, at the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, underwrites it in New York. And so these kids are, are there and all often go backstage to just say hi or something. And most of these kids have no interest in the performing arts as a, as a career choice, but they were moved by something in this curriculum, in this process, that made them want to create and speak out loud in front of 1,300 of their peers right. and peers that they have never met and stand on a Broadway stage. And to hear a kid create material about Phyllis Wheatley, like, who cares if they know the lyrics to the show? Right. Look what they made. Yeah. Look, look what they've wrought. Look what, oh. what, look, you know. And so that's the, that's the larger gesture that I think gets us so excited about, about that sort of implementation across the country. There are 20,000 kids every year that will see that show right. in that city. And so as we grow, that, you know, hopefully there's a multiplier. So, back, so, so at what point do you realize, you know, 2012, you do the, um, at the Lincoln Center night, you start doing these workshops, you're, having, you're, you're casting actors who are not you know, middle-aged white men to play the Founding Fathers. At what point does it become, well, how do you, you know, is that now an integral part of producing Hamilton, that you've got a cast that looks like yes. your, your Broadway cast? No, it's, it's not, the Broadway cast is not a template for that, other than the, 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 the aggregate of, uh, of a diverse group. You know, so, 
uh, you know, so when you, if you look at our Chicago company, these are not doppelgangers. These are not, and there's no sort of replication going on in any way. It's about essential characteristics and qualities and maintaining an incredibly diverse cast, but, but it's not defined by what, by what the original company was. Because so there are some, I mean, you've got a, a, a Latino actor playing Hamilton. Mm -hmm. There's an African-American actor playing Burr mm -hmm. and Washington. But these are, so this has happened the first and second time out, but it's not, when you think about these characters in your head, you're not necessarily thinking. That's right. And, and you know, and I mean, you can, you know, if you thought about, you know, any of these things, you know, it, it was, it, it's also, you know, important to me that as we're building each company, we're finding the right uh, alchemy for that company. Mm -hmm. uh, I want the production in Chicago to feel like it's a production that originated in Chicago because it did. You know, there's, and I said this to the New York company, and I, and I will always say this. I told them, I'm, you will never hear me say the word replace when you leave the show, because I will not replace you, because I cannot replace you. Mm -hmm. I will find someone else to come and tell the story who will play this role. And all of the work that we do honors that original company, mm -hmm. and yet hopefully can stand on its own. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, my hope is that people that get, if they're, if they're able to see the New York company in, in Chicago, or one of the other companies that will happen, that it will be the, the sum of those parts will be particularly great, because it's not just watching something uh, and, and pretending we're on 46th Street in New York City, right. because we're not. And I wanted, I, you know, the, the idea of coming to Chicago, of, of coming here and setting up our tent, and staying as long as the city will have us, and saying, you It'll be a while, well, I, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> well, um, we hope so, because, I, you know, what I, the, 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 there's, there's something about going to someone else's town and saying, let us be a guest here. Wake up in your bed, go to your job, live your life, go to your school, and come visit us at a place that you know. And then go back home and sleep in your bed or your apartment. You know, let us be part of your life. You don't have to pack up and come here and make, it, make that kind of effort yeah. um, that I think is, uh, is is the power of theater and why we're so, you know, right. we're so, it, 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 so proud to be part of the, this, this com you know, this, this company being part of this city of actors so the, and storytellers. So, so when you're thinking about cast, I mean, you, you are now casting the Los Angeles company that, that's gonna go on tour. So when you, the, what's important, if I understand it right, is the, is the principle that it's going to be a diverse group of performers yes. who are going to, so it's not about the specific. That's right, that's right. That's right. Well, so let, let's talk about those actors some more. Um, let's, uh, the next moment, no, first I want to talk about writing a little bit. Let's skip ahead a little bit more to another one of these moments when you have choices to make. I love it's like, you know, like the year of 2012, and what's nice, like later you can be like, let's just skip that. I'm like, yeah, that was a hard year. <laughs> <laughs> we really worked hard. <laughs> Um, All right, 2012, later. This is, no, but this is a moment. This is a moment, in tw it's 2013. Mm. There's a workshop that you do where, like virtually all musicals that are bound for Broadway, as Hamilton is by that point. Uh, well, we, I mean, that was not something okay, 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 it's not, you know, uh, there's an outside chance it's not going to Broadway. But it is, a, but it is at this point, it is a, you, you are making something for the stage. We're making something for the right. stage, but we know we want to start off-Broadway somewhere. Right. But what th this thing that you're making for the stage, like most musical theater made for the stage, you look for someone who's going to write the libretto, which means the scenes, the, the dialogue between the songs that Lynn is planning on writing, which is the format of most musicals. It's the format of In the Heights. You do a workshop with a playwright that you admire greatly, and you guys come away thinking, like, maybe we need to rethink this. Yes. Like, that's a gut check moment of having to make a decision about this. What's that decision, what's that thought process like for you? You know, I, I find that, gaining experience and, and, uh, and doing this for a little while allows you to silence the noise that occasionally gets in the way of your gut mm -hmm. and your instinct. And so it was just apparent. It, it, it just felt like whenever we, we would move to a, a more traditional book scene, no matter how dazzling or good the writing was, there was some sort of return to earth. And Lynn's writing uh, in, in, the, in the numbers and in these songs and the storytelling was so clear and so powerful that it felt like he needed to have the, the confidence to, to attempt to sustain that. Hmm. But I don't know that we could have gotten there unless we went through those six, eight right. months of working with a, you know, with, a, with a really good writer on a more traditional libretto right. and seeing what happened. And, but we all, like, we knew. You know, uh, Jeffrey Seller, who is, is our, our, one of our producers, um, and, and Lynn and I, we sort of left the same message for each other the next day. Right. Like, oh, we knew, and the, the, 
you know, the, the, the dynamic that Lynn and I have is one where, you know, I tell him he's overrated and he says thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, he doesn't always say thank you. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, my, you know, my, my affection for Lynn as a human being is significant. Um, my connection to him as a collaborator is now, you know, 13, 14 years in. Right. And so there's, a, there's, a, there's an almost subliminal way that we can communicate. Right. You know, it's, it, I mean, an eyebrow is like two paragraphs. <laughs> so it's like, I get it with your eyebrows. Um, and so we just knew. We needed to go through the thing. And yeah. like, that's the other, that's something that I talk about a lot when I'm, I'm working. And, and it's, it's mostly to give myself permission too. But if you were rehearsing a show and you're gonna rehearse for five weeks, there is going to be a first day of rehearsal. And it's not going to feel like the eighth day or the 14th day or the 26th day. Mm. It's just not. So don't try to be at eight or 14 or 26. Mm. And so even when we were going through the process, even if you have an instinct, maybe this isn't quite the thing, right. okay, know that, but continue to move through it. And so it was a very, uh, you know, it was, a, it was an incredibly informative and illuminating six or eight months that got us to where we needed to go. Right. Is there a moment where you think, I, I mean, I literally six hours ago had a conversation with a producer who's developing a project who thinks that uh, the songs are great, but she's not sure if the book is gonna hold up, and so she's not sure if she's gonna proceed with it. Is there a moment where you think, well, we've got good songs, we have a good writer, it's not holding together, maybe we're wrong about this one? No. You knew. Yes. It was just about finding the right way forward. It was about, because, because it wasn't about the inability of a writer to contribute. It was right. about us being able to clearly identify that the propulsion and energy of Hamilton was captured in the music so effectively. Right. Why, why would we rest from that? We could, you can still build in a, a cadence to a show where it can breathe and you can let the audience breathe. You know, right. the show is very carefully calibrated. We all yeah. sort of step, step back and looked at that. So no, that was, not, that, that was not going to deter us. So let's talk about that writing relationship that you have with Lynn. It, if, if I understand it right, you're, you're basically the one who hears his stuff first, or you read what he's coming up with first. And you talked earlier about how you, you feel like your role as a director is to be the audience, but it's hard. I mean, a lot of material. An audience right. with a microphone. <laughs> right. But when you're the, you know, you're the first one in on new material, an audience is sometimes the last thing that somebody needs, right? I mean, how do you, I mean, to take, I mean, you guys have worked on, on several projects at this point, but, but in those like 2013, like really figuring out what this thing is, what are those conversations like? Well, you know, when in 2000, you know, preparing, let's say, I think it's probably preparing for the, the Lincoln Center concert. Okay. Uh, Lynn, Lynn and I both decided to, he was gonna reread the book and I was gonna read the book. And I said to him, let me read this without you telling me where you think the songs might be or which characters are compelling to you or, or which scenes might make a good uh, moment. I have, one, I have one attempt right now to do that without you in my brain. Right. So, and you have one without, you know, without me in yours. So let's make our list and then let's sit and see where the Venn diagram intersects. Mm -hmm. So you know, I have this, 15 page single space document of my notes mm -hmm. from my first read of that. Right. And more often, you know, a couple times a page, there were these overlaps. There were these, these connective, um, you know, and, and very clear paths. Okay, that spoke to him, it spoke to me. Let's see if there's anything there. Let's see if there's anything there. Yeah. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, we had talked about the idea of it. Lynn wrote Helpless, and we did Helpless in 2012 at that, at that, at that concert. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point, Angelica Schuyler had one line, which was, I'm just saying, if you really love me, you would share them. <laughs> um, uh, and we both knew that there was an opportunity to explore this dynamic, not only the, the possible triangle, but also the love that these two sisters had for each other. Right. And that was compelling to both of us. Hmm. And it was in a conversation after that concert, I don't even remember when, when Satisfied appeared, but I remember talking about his, the structure that he had come up with in Helpless, which sort of takes you through their meeting and then advances time. And in that conversation, we started talking about what did that look like from Angelica's point, Angelica's point of view. <laughs> and so right. Lynn sort of sits up, and I was like, oh, here he goes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, there's, a, there's a story that I heard uh, that Liv Ullman said about being married to, to Bergman, and she was on a chat show, and, and someone said, you know, so what's it like being married to him? Uh, or being with him, and she said, well, when he wakes up in the middle of the night with a nightmare, I'm starring in it six months later. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So <laughs> I'm pretty clear when Lynn's gonna bring in a song. Right. Um, <laughs> and then there will also be something that he writes that we never talked about, and he says, oh, what about this? Uh -huh. And you also have to be open enough to allow those things to happen. So, right. um, so I'm an early audience for sure, and then once we started doing the concert, Alex became an early audience, mm -hmm. and, you know, and Jeffrey, and then we started working right. you know, with, with Oscar you know, after that. So I, I know that um, it's an act of faith to share something at an yeah. early stage. Yeah. Uh, and, and he's always been very trusting about those things. Right, but it's funny you mentioned going back and reading the book. When I started work writing the Hamilton book, I also went back and reread Chernow's book. And I was stunned by not, it, partly it's what everybody sees. When, when you go to see Hamilton, the way that these dramatic incidents are strung together, but the stuff that's not there the stuff that you guys didn't dramatize, that you knew to leave out or tried for a little while and cut, shows this incredible discipline. I made a list. I'm not gonna do the full list, but these are a couple of the things that happened. I feel like I'm being sandbagged. In Hamilton's life. How dare you leave out, no, I'm kidding. But this stuff, you know, we've all seen a bunch of musicals. You sort of get a feel for the kinds of things that, that work in musicals. The, these, these crazy dramatic things, Hamilton's ship on the way to the United States caught on fire. Uh, the, British, the, stage. the British attacked the Schuyler Mansion. And I guess, and I don't remember it clearly, but I think one of them like, like had to fight one of the British troops or something. There was a parade for Hamilton through New York City. Hamiltonia. Hamilton, yeah, Oneana or something. Yeah, yeah. Hamilton and Jefferson were together, uh, Madison rather, at, together at the Constitutional Convention. Those are two of your characters. It seems like a moment when you can draw, you didn't. Jefferson and Angelica maybe had some kind of relationship, which was in for like three lines and then it left. I'm sure Lynn will put it on YouTube later, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, then this, and then the banquet where Hamilton and Burr are together uh, three whatever nights before, but the but the to be ruthless about saying this is the story we're telling and not to get distracted by the shiny things along the way to me is as impressive as anything that's actually in the show. Oh. Um, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, Ron's book did a number of things. It provided inspiration. It was this, um, it was this map mm -hmm. uh, of, of sorts that we could follow. Um, it, it was so well crafted, and and Ron, who <coughs> writes like a novelist, he writes with a you know, with with a feel for a protagonist who's moving through a story. So so Ron's book was not a series of events. Right. It wasn't this, then this, then this, and we've all seen that dramatized, and it's not always the most um, exciting thing to watch. <laughs> so we tried to be rigorous as we were thinking about all of you know that that parade with Hamilton was going to be the end of Act One. Like there are early, like there are early outlines where that, like, oh, I mean, how could that not be the end of Act right. One? Um, and then he wrote Nonstop, which was supposed to be the top of Act Two, which is why, you know, after the war I went back to New York, was like a great thing to do coming back from a, an act <laughs> right. break. Right. Unless you do it before the act right. Um, right. and out of Theodosia. Um, so, you know, th there was another thing that people, uh, you know, inquired about as we were then developing the show, went to New York stage and film and, um, in the, the summer of 2013, mm -hmm. and just did the first act and about four songs of the second act. And we had um, music stands, you know, like no staging. There, there was a lot of conversation from people that saw the show about us ending the first act after Yorktown. Mm -hmm. And most, most musicals that I think pull you into the second act end the act with a dramatic question. Mm -hmm. Winning a war is not, is, is not a, a question. Right. Um, it's, a, it's some kind of statement. Now, what comes next is that, right? Like, there is a way to drop the, the curtain, which the, is the king the coming out The six of you that haven't. <laughs> Why are you here? <laughs> is it Jeremy? Is it his hair? <laughs> um, so, but then, you know, we also knew that there was this, in, this moment with Theodosia, when Lynn wrote right. Theodosia, which is another thing that some people questioned, not, not in our group, but, do we really need this moment um, right. to take this breath that allowed us then to address the death of Lawrence as one thing comes in, you know, right. what, is, what does the universe take away from him? And even within the numbers, you know, this, I'm remembering this now, Dear Theodosia in the early workshops ended with this, I think it was the last chorus where you've got the ensemble, the ensemble singing, yeah. which was the most beautiful thing you've ever heard in your life. You've heard the song, now imagine 20 people singing it. It was glorious. You guys cut it. Yeah, Alex is yelling at me somewhere. <laughs> Uh, we did. Um, bye. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, no, but, but, but the other thing, like just to continue that, like when we were at the public, Theodosia also used to end with applause. Right. 
And we thought, no, we, we have to keep on moving. We, now, we, knew, we know the audience is thinking, you won the war, the king came out, when am I gonna get to go to the bathroom? <laughs> right? Right. So we took out the applause because it was just another, it was another in and out that we yeah. had to overcome. So those were things that we found you know, in front of a group of people. What was the toughest thing, the thing that you wish you'd been able to keep in that you couldn't keep in? Not necessarily a thing that you cut, a thing that never got written. A thing that never got written? Yeah, like a thing on that I, list yeah, I mean, of incidents. The, that you, um, this, this thing that Jeremy mentioned, um, which was this scene a few days before they, the two of them had the duel, where both of them were at the Society of the Cincinnati, where they were members, and apparently Hamilton was you know, standing on a table, bellowing, and Burr was brooding in the corner. Um, and yet, there they were in the same place, right. about to face off. You know, the, the story that Hamilton had loaned Burr money, you know, possibly, you know, within weeks of it happening. You know, just like yeah. this kind of stuff that just was confused, like not confusing to the, to the complexity of it, but wow, like how much, like there's just, it was so much thornier and complicated. Yeah. Um, but you also have to keep on drawing this, this clear line and make sure that the, um, I, I think that Linda's an incredible job, as, as do the actors interpreting Burr, of making him as nuanced and complicated as possible. Right. You know, th that was... That was something that Lynn had a lot of conversations with us about, you know, as we were making the show, yeah. that Burr with the twirling mustache was not interesting for him to write. Right. Um, and I remember that was something that we never even put pen to paper on, but felt like it was something to do. Yeah. Uh, and then it just, and then all of a sudden you get there and sometimes you, you've realized you've already arrived. Mm -hmm. And this way that you thought you would arrive uh, is, is, is something that you didn't need. You didn't right. need to build a raft to get there. All of a sudden you're there. There's this principle, um, Stephen Sondheim's book, Finishing the Hat, was a big influence on the way that the Hamilton book turned out. Um, and the, he has these writing principles at the beginning of the book, and one of them, the first one, is content dictates form, which means you have to figure out the story you're trying to tell, and that suggests the shape of the story. And there ought to be like a 1B under that, which says, and then once you know that form, you have to be so ruthless about sticking to the shape of it and know that if you're, you know, that's a great, like it would have been so easy to, to pin that at the end of the outline and say, well, we know we're gonna end up here at this dinner. And then to feel like, no, actually we don't need it and take it off. This is a thing like I've been, you know, the Hamilton book came in the middle of this long book project, book writing project that I've been working on. And so for me, it was really useful to step out of the world of these, it's a nonfiction book about five American radical, young American radicals, and to step out of the writing process of that and look at the, at the discipline that you guys showed to find that narrative line and stick to it at every step is incredibly impressive. As we were working on a story about these proto-American radicals. Well, right, this right. is he the really, thing. He really departed. The, right, yeah, this is, um, I, I just got one line and I'm just like, <laughs> But, but no, but this is, you know, you, when I left the, I was on the staff of the public theater, I left at the end of last year. I live in Chicago now with my family. Hey, come on, uh, local boy done good. Look at him, come on. I miss hot dogs. I'm sad about the Cubs last night. I got all that stuff. <laughs> we'll talk at the reception. Um, but No uh, ketchup, guys, no ketchup. <laughs> no ketchup, I know about that. But, um, uh, but where's it going with that? But, but when, I, when I sent the email around to all my friends, it said, I'm leaving the public and I'm gonna go finish my book about young radicals. And Tommy had the best email back, which was, well, you kind of just did finish a book about the young radicals, <laughs> meaning the one about Hamilton. And it's true, there is a way that these, that, that um, the argument that's in the Hamilton book, which says we have been fighting about these ideals for 200 something years, that these figures I'm writing about in the 19 teens are kind of the middle section of that. I mean, they're the same big questions about who, you know, who belongs here, who gets a voice, who gets to talk. Anyway, um, but I wanna move on now. I wanna move to the next step while we have time. Um, and I wanna talk about um, the rehearsal process. Uh, specifically, uh, it's the summer of 2015 now. Uh, the Broadway move has been announced. You are getting everybody in tip-top shape um, this is one of the rehearsals that I came to and attended, and you said something that I loved to one of the actors. You were encouraging her to try things, and you said, open the bag up, meaning just try whatever you wanna try. And from talking to people around the company, that was not an exceptional note. That's actually the way you think about your approach to most of the conversations that you have, that you're trying to bring something out of these actors. Can you talk about what, how, your, your approach to working with specific performers that way? Uh, yeah, you know, I, you know, I have a particular task because we had done 117 performances at the public, 
and we had learned a lot, and it had gone pretty well, and then you have to be unafraid that you're going to break the thing. Mm -hmm. And so 117 performances, that's, that's a fair amount for an actor to start to get into a groove. Mm -hmm. The difference between a groove and a rut is generally mm -hmm. a couple of inches, right? So <laughs> you have to be really careful about that. Well, that might get trending. <laughs> what do you think about that, America? <laughs> um, or room in Chicago? <laughs> um, so, you know, look, I, I think a lot of what, you know, a lot of who I am is informed by the fact that, um, you know, I'm in a very long-term relationship with uh, a, a performer um, and learning from her and watching what it means to go and do a show for a year, what it means to get ready for an audition and prepare, has given me an incredible amount of insight and compassion and it informs how I run my rehearsal room, it informs mm -hmm. how I run an audition room. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to make the kind of room I would wanna be in. And my job is to set the temperature. Hmm. And you know, if, if you're an actor in a show, you, sh you arrive on the first day and someone says, this is your brother, this is your mom, and you love her. Hmm. <laughs> and you're like, I'm sorry, which one are you? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, what? Like, and you meet on the day. Right. I'm, you know, along with a couple other people, I'm one of the people that is deciding who's gonna be in the room. And so I feel an enormous responsibility huh. to try to create an environment where there's, uh, there's enough space to explore, where there's uh, an ability to you know, topple over and get back up. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I spent a lot of my, my early part of my career in my 20s always having to have the answer, mm -hmm. which was- What do you mean? I, I thought, well, I'm the director. Oh, you th I, should, I should know, yeah. and I didn't know, and I didn't give myself permission to say I don't know. Mm -hmm. And so if I, if I can create that space for the actors, I should also be able to have it for myself, and so it's like a feedback loop. You know, I, there are gonna be, there are, sometimes the answer is we'll figure it out tomorrow. Sometimes the answer is three. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> it's blue. Um, and there are things that you, you, you know and you feel really connected to, and then there are also moments that you, you, you understand that the exploration of that is, is probably what's gonna come with you, huh. more so than where you're gonna go. You know, that, that conversation which was with Renee, if, yeah. if I, you know, um, I don't know that anything we did ended up in the show. But that doesn't matter, like I can't, I, I can't be thinking about that, just like she can't be thinking about that. Right. And what I'm trying to do is remove any of that pressure from any of the actors right. that, that we're thinking about the performance right now. So it's gotta happen that you think the answer is three, whatever and an actor is sure that the answer is seven. You're the director. How do you negotiate those moments? I mean, are there times, there's gotta be times as a director. Like three plus seven divided by two. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, there, but, but the moments have gotta come when it's like he's not or she's not understanding what that line is supposed to do. I could give the reading right now and we could all go home. Oh uh, yeah, uh, that doesn't seem fun for me. You don't do that? No, um, not, I'm not gonna say that as a have I done that? Sure, but it's generally when an actor said, just, you know, let, let's talk about it. There's some actors that, that like that conversation. Right. Some actors don't ever want you to give them their staging. They wanna just find the thing. Some of them say, can you tell me where to go? Like, it just depends. I mean, every relationship, it's code switching. You right. have to have a different relationship with everybody. Right. And if you're speaking the same way to everyone, you are failing as a director. Hmm. I can talk to the group and have one unified group that can hear whatever ideas, you know, that I want to, uh, make clear that we're gonna approach or attack today, um, and I believe in that kind of transparency, but I also should have a different relationship with David than I should with Chris, mm -hmm. or with Pippa, or with, with Leslie, or with right. Anthony, or, or, or anybody, you know? Right. Just like I'm talking to Andy Blankenbuehler, our choreographer, mm -hmm. in a different way than I am with Alex. Right. This being Chicago, I should, I should ask you about this. You told me that you're a fan of Phil Jackson's books. Come on, you kidding me? <laughs> the legend? Well, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but what, Phil Jackson? 11 right? Rings? <laughs> Who didn't read that? But what is, it about, what is it about his approach to working with very, very talented people that, that, connects, that you connect to? Because he, he understood that his job, and I have a, I have a you know, theory that, that the relationship between coaching and directing is, is, uh, is a direct one. Because you spend more time doing sports, I think. That's right, yes, that. right. absolutely. Um, the job is get a group of people in the room who might have never met. You don't know where they come from or what their story is, and you have to be clear about what the, what the goal is. Mm -hmm. What are we trying to do? Are we on the same page? Are we telling the same story? And that's what Phil Jackson did. 
that's what Vince Lombardi did, that's what Bill Belichick does. They might not do it in the way that I do it, mm -hmm. but that's what Brad Stevens does, you know? You know I mean, like, that's what these coaches do, and that's what I'm fascinated by. Mm. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the difference between coaching in college and the pros is also interesting, right? Because right. there's a, you're dealing with, you know, young men or women that are between 18 and 23. That's a different experience. I can be working with someone who's 18 to 85. Right. And they and we're all in the same room. Right. So it's a uh, it's a it's a. So it's a that challenge. room in the summer of 2015 was uh, the Richard Rogers Theater, uh, which in the the week it was July what 13th was first preview. Yeah, something around that. I don't remember. Because I, anyway, I'm July kidding, 13th. Guys. July 13th was uh, bonkers. The city there have been three store in the in the in the Augusta New York Times, I think there have been three stories in the past 72 hours about Hamilton, one of which was on the front page of the paper. There were hundreds of people just sort of milling around 46th Street outside the theater all that day. <laughs> Jeremy uh, with like a, like a reporter's cap. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, then, and then inside, you step in, and inside where Tommy is going through the, the last few you know, rehearsal notes, I think, uh, it's like another day on the job. That the, all the stress and the tension and the excitement and the drama that everyone on the street is is swept along by, you have the company feeling completely detached from. Like it has nothing to do with them somehow. And it's this amazing kind of like mass Jedi mind trick that you pulled on them. <laughs> How do you do, like it, it, was that conscious to say we are gonna have to keep this outside of this room for us to do our jobs? It was acknowledging that it was happening outside, but what was happening outside didn't impact or influence or change what we were trying to accomplish. And so what I said to the company many times is we, there are certain things we can't control. What we can control is how hard we work and what our attitude is in that effort. Mm. That's really it. What, what people say about it is, is beyond our control. Let's make something that we're proud of. Let's make it in a way that we're proud of. Right. And, the, you know, and that wall on 46th Street that we walk into the stage door, there, they will come in here. We are making the show for an audience. That, that's, that's why we're here. Right. But they will, they will come and sit there at eight o'clock and that will feel the way that feels. And until then, let's go through this list. Let's do the things that we need to do so that we're ready to uh, be as confident and robust as we can to, to do that performance. And you know, I, having, you know, David Diggs is a pretty like chilled out cat. I mean, that guy is, <laughs> really, and he's from Oakland, if you didn't know. Um, <laughs> and David talked about coming out in the opening number and then not remembering anything for the next 20 minutes. And most of the cast said they didn't think they could get through the show. I mean, what happened from that audience, the, the, the back and forth of energy was pretty astonishing. Yeah. The Rogers doesn't have a lot of backstage public <laughs> space, so everyone ends up congregating on the stage at the end. And at the end, I'd say half the company was in tears. Uh, people were just shaken by what they'd just gone through. And, and so that was maybe going to happen. So right. my job is to remind us that the thing we have to hold on to is let's make this our haven. Mm. From, from 8 to 10.48, yeah. I know where you're standing, you know, you know what you're saying, you know how you're moving, you know what you're wearing. There's yeah. comfort in that. And mm -hmm. I think that most of, the, most of the company started to acknowledge that that was actually the most relaxing part of their day. Mm. Um, and so that was, um, that was a gift. So that's, that's, in a way, that's a service you're providing to them. But then what about you? So you can't, you don't have I'm luxury. Like weeping in the back. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but what do you do? But how do you get yourself in a position where you can focus on the work when you're trying, because you, you don't have that luxury of, for the next two hours and 48 minutes of being able to just, right? I mean, you have Yeah, but I have, a job, but I have a job to do, and I have to go do my job, just like they do. So... If they can do their job, I should be able Your to do Your pulse is like 45, and it just never goes above that, does it? Well, as I've said, like, you know, if, if there's one through 10, yeah. I just hang out between like four and seven. <laughs> so, like, Always. I, I, yeah, you, like I'm capable of joy. I mean, you literally. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like, you know, you, I'm not like screaming and running around. <laughs> right, I mean. but you literally directed Hamilton, and then three months later directed Grease Live on, <laughs> on the TV. And basically, I've never broken stride. I've never seemed to have broken a sweat. Do you belong to like a, night, a late night like fight club or something where you like? <laughs> well, get I can't this talk about that, as you, as you would know. Um, but but how but how is it possible? To, I mean, is it you know is this a does it take discipline for you to stay this contained all the time, or is this just genuinely you are that calm a person when you're working? 
I'm, I'm a pretty calm person in life. So right. I, it's just, you know, the, the nice thing about my job is that who you are as a person is required in your, in your workplace. Not everybody right. has that opportunity, you right. know, and I, I see that as a, you know, uh, as a, <laughs> this, this kind of remarkable occurrence that I get right. to bring who I am into the world right. um, that I'm working in, just like the, the writer does, just like yeah. incredible designers will. Um, so, you know, my job is to support them. I mean, this is a big question to get into this when we're up against the clock, but it is, we have like four hours, right, guys? <laughs> is that what we're doing? Do you guys, I'm just kidding, you guys three. pack the lunch, right? <laughs> yeah. But you, but, you know, there's a, uh, I, I had a, a directing teacher once who, 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 you know, managed to silence a room full of eager 19 year olds by saying, directing's really hard. Listen, if there's anything else you can do with your life, you should do it. <laughs> you clearly have, are the sort of person who'd be succeeding at just about anything you wanted to do. You're directing plays for the most part, and now you're developing projects for television, and I assume for film at some point pretty soon, but what is it about directing that keeps you, that keeps you interested and you want to keep doing it? Because it makes me feel useful. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, and, and you see this when you talk to people that are younger than me trying to figure out what they want to do or people that are moving out of their jobs and retiring or people that aren't doing something they care about doing is it's, uh, you don't feel accessed. You don't, you don't feel like your utility is being employed. Mm -hmm. And I, I happened to find something with a group of friends uh, coming out of Wesleyan who believed in me and I believed in them and they they afforded me this faith and confidence when I hadn't proven it other than they knew that I was going to be reliable and trustworthy and work hard. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't have, I didn't take any directing classes. Uh, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have anything to rely on. I had mm -hmm. to go and learn. But I just, you know, I, I want to, I'm no different than anybody else. I want to wake up in the, in the morning and, and feel like I can take these, these skills that I have and bring them to the table and be like, does anybody need blueberries or a butter knife? You know, <laughs> right. these are the right. two things I have. Yeah, you could also tell that convincing lie about driving the van, right? You told me the story once when you were starting out. Well, I didn't lie, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> it's going pretty well. Um, so I, I, uh, I applied to be an assistant to the dramaturg at Arena Stage. That's and right. the woman who was running the, the program at the time was a woman named Kathy Madison. I was from the DC area, I thought I'd go back and do that. And I wanted to learn about script and just like, be in a big institutional theater because I was sort of late to the game and thought that would be a good unofficial MFA program. She said, I need you to go get any job in the theater and then reapply in a year. And so I heard about this opening through a friend of mine to be an ASM, an assistant stage manager. And so I wrote my cover letter and like I put on a jacket and a tie and, you know, and brought in my, you know, <coughs> CV and, you know, I, what are my thesis about. And the last line said, P.S. I make a mean cup of coffee. The only thing circled on it was that. <laughs> and I was kind of like, no, no, we don't have to talk about O'Neill. I only, I was with him all year. Um, and during the course of this conversation, the, the guy that I was talking to said, this sounds great. I want you to know also part of your duties will be driving a 15 pass van into New York and getting the actors two to four times a day. You can drive a van, right? And I was like, can I? <laughs> <laughs> See? Not a lie. Not a lie. <laughs> Uh, so in a couple of minutes, we're going to throw it open to questions, but I want to talk about Chicago a little bit. Yes. Now, so you've been all the way around the track with the full production of Hamilton. It, it was uh, downtown. It was on Broadway. Uh, what, did you, what did you learn from New York that you have been able to apply to Chicago? What I learned was the way we made New York felt like we were taking that group of talented people and molding them to the show and the show to them. So even if all of the words that we say are the same and all the notes are the same and 99% of the, the patterns and the choreography are the same here, that it shouldn't be beholden to that, only to the spirit of that show. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this was the first time I'd ever rehearsed the show without us trying to finish the show. Right. You know, even when we went to Broadway, there were right. pretty significant changes from off-Broadway to, to Broadway. And we would, you know, when you rehearse a show, often you have three rooms. There's like a sort of two big rooms and then a small room. Um, and Lynn would often be in the small room, like surfing the internet and like pretending I didn't know. <laughs> He's like a kid who's like, oh, how'd that get there? I was like, because you were, never mind. Um, and so, you know, I would be in room A or B or working with, with Andy or Alex and, and, and the company. And then I would go in to see if, if Lynn was, was writing, so-called. And, and we would talk about the thing and right. he would say, here's something or, you know, I'm still working on it. And that, 
that part of my brain had to always be engaged there all the way through previews. Lynn was working on the final duel up through the process of previews even on Broadway. And I just had to come in and make the show this time. You know, so this, this idea that, I, I, that we, we talked about, which is making a new musical is like marching across a bridge that you're still building. Mm. Now, we know how to build the bridge, right. so let's go and build the bridge. Um, so it was, it was full of joy and th this, this sense of liberation yeah. because we, we didn't have to do this other part so of it. So what, as you're watching the show now, watching previews and opening night is day after tomorrow, I mean, what's your inner monologue? Are you just looking for things that need fixing? Or can you enjoy it at this point? Or when you see it, are you just looking for the, you're just making sure that it's the way it ought to be? Um, I'm able to enjoy it for sure. Um, you know, I'm not someone, you know, you, you hear a lot of people that make things say that whenever they look at it, they just see the flaws. Yeah. Like, sure, there are things that I wish I had done better or that we could have cooked more, but, but this is, this is where we are. Like, I, I just, um, I'm, I'm so proud of the, the way that we made this. This company is phenomenal. Um, the way that it's, uh, that it's imbued this show with, with an energy that feels like it's, it's of this town. I, I don't know how to describe it. I've, I've been here just for a month, well, but, but. But that's interesting. Is it, do you see a Chicago audience reacting differently than a New York audience did? Yes, but, it, but you know, the laugh is in the same place. You know, the, yeah. the quiet is in the same place. But, but it's just, it's, it's, it's different. It's a different thing. You know, there are 500 more people here. Mm -hmm. um, that's 40% more of an audience. That's a yeah, different thing in terms the, of energy. The, the theater here, the private bank theater is 1,800 and the Rogers is 13. Yeah, yeah it's 1,340 and 1,900. You know, so, you know, it's, that, that's a significant change. Now, does that make you feel further from the show? Absolutely not. Is this theater the exact place for us to be? Yes, like, I mean, I really firmly believe that. But, you know, what I, what I find happens most often now because there is a point when you are directing something where um, you just have to take your hands off it and put your pencils down and push back from the desk and say, that's the show. You have to do that. You have to give them the show. And I, I've long maintained that if the, if the company needs me there for the show to, to work and run, then I failed. Mm -hmm. I'm building scaffolding. I'm taking the scaffolding off, and there better be something there that has integrity and structure. Mm -hmm. And then I need to be able to go away. Right. And so when I'm watching, what I often find happens is I'm struck and, and moved by the contribution of the people making it. You know, I, I remember standing next to Andy Blankenbuehler, who's our incredibly gifted choreographer, and yes, I mean, if that's Andy, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Call me back, Andy, all right? Um, and there's a moment in Nonstop where, why do you write, why do you write, and then it sort of slams to this desk, yeah. and the ensemble makes the desk, and Hamilton's there, and Andy and I were watching this, you know, a couple months ago, and it got to that moment, and I just looked at him, I said, it's, it's as beautiful as anything you've ever made. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one moment in a thousand moments he crafted, because I know that Andy spent 15 hours thinking about that, that moment, right. and the distillation of it. All the work is invisible, and it's just the expression of it. Right. So the, 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 the designers, you know, this cast, is their opportunity to, to be um, celebrated right. is the thing that makes me most pleased, I think. All right, so we have a few minutes left to take some questions from the audience. I believe there are some microphones out there, uh, and there are some lovely people holding the microphones. Please raise your hand, and they'll find you. Now, there are a lot of you, and there are not many of us. So it just asks, so we can hear from as many people as possible in the time we have. Just keep it super short, no follow-up questions. Just like, just take your best shot right off, right off the blocks, <laughs> and we'll all get out of here. Sorry? I'm going to... I'm gonna select, I really can't see. Uh, is there a hand over here? I see a hand here in the fourth, fifth row. Uh, wait for the mic, please. And after that, does anyone else have a hand up just so we can keep moving? There, uh, on the aisle, most of the way back, so we'll go there next. Uh, right by the, yes, hi. Hi, I saw the show in New York about three weeks ago, and since I listened to the cast recording for a year, I tried to really focus on the, um, the movement and the staging and the choreography, and so since you were just talking about that, could you talk a little more about that collaboration and mm. your role versus the choreographer's role when you have an idea, how it becomes realized in, in the movement and in the staging? I'm thinking about the bullet, mm -hmm. that character and how that goes and just, just kind of that collaboration. What does a director do versus what a choreographer does? I mean, essentially they're trying to do the same thing. Um, there, are, there are certain responsibilities that you have as a director that I think the choreographer doesn't always have to be ultra concerned about, but any choreographer of real substance, and Andy is one of them, and he's also an incredible director in his own right, 
you know, all the conversations happen. You know, so when I very early on was talking to Paul Taswell about what this could look like, Paul's our costume designer, and we sort of came up with this idea that from the neck down is then and the neck up is now. Um, that the show would look like then, but move in a contemporary way, so that tension would exist. Obviously, that has a great impact on the choreographer. So bring in Andy as early as possible. You know, Andy and I would just talk through every moment and every scene, and then I'm also smart enough to let him go away and work, and then come back and say, this is what I've made, and show me something that is probably a week's worth of stuff, and it might be, you know, 16 bars. It might be half a song. Um, and, you know, the, the bullet, for instance, we were very influenced by The Matrix <laughs> and bullet time. So Andy's, you know, and Andy and I made a production of The Wiz uh, with Alex Lacamoire a few, about seven years ago. And there was a, obviously, a very famous twister in The Wiz. Um, and there was a hurricane in this show. And the hurricane in the show, the research and development was done in that tornado. <laughs> so we blew apart this house then, and everything sort of stopped, and we held that. And so when we came back to it years later, here was another opportunity to refine, to, to reflect. To, you know, so you, you take from earlier inspiration that you have, and you just make sure that you always are clear that, that you are telling the same story. We knew that, I, I said to uh, Howell Binkley very early on, and, and with Andy as well, no blackouts. We end, we end the show on a blackout, we'll have a blackout at the end of the act, that's it. Don't mm -hmm. stop going, because every time you black out, you're creating another thing the audience has to get in and out of. And again, there's a, there's a finite amount of energy. What we felt like downstairs, uh, downstairs um, downtown at the, at the public happened was, we had this great 14 course meal, but I think people only wanted 12. Like, those last couple courses, you're like, I get it, I get it. You know? <laughs> so, so sometimes it's about just pulling away so you can be as full as possible. But it's lots of conversations. It's a great lots question. Of conversations. Thank you. Uh, over here? Oh, that's actually, I think there's another one down on the aisle. Yeah, right there. Go ahead. Um, so the set is very specific to uh, Hamilton. Like there's the concentric circles in the middle and then there's the, the pieces that jut out at the top. How did you figure that out? Um, how did you think about that versus just having a regular like set, like I don't even know, like a Wicked or something like that? Like, how did you think to do the concentric circles in the middle and have people walking down the street, but having them walk in the circle? Thanks. Um, uh, that's another good question, and, and it allows me to speak about David Corns, our you know remarkable set designer. David and I had done a bunch of shows together, including The Wiz, um, so we knew how to do that hurricane, um, but. <laughs> There were a couple things that we knew early on. One is we wanted to make the show powered and moved by the people that were also powering and moving the country. So there's not a lot of automation in our show. There's like a staircase that goes down and there's some things that rotate on the ground, but that's it. Nothing else really flies in. It's all motivated by the people. We bring the furniture in, we bring the furniture off, and that was important. We wanted it to be made by the people that were making the ships of the day. So the materials are reflective of that. We also, you know, there was a moment when I looked at a really early iteration. You're probably seeing what was like the, you know, the 46th iteration of a model. David would, we would talk, we would talk, we would talk. He'd do a rendering, he'd build a model, we'd stare at the model, which is sort of like looking at a dollhouse. And then, you know, we would say, okay, it looks like Deadwood. How does something not look like Deadwood, but it looks more like an East Coast thing? You know, like, so you, you have these questions about it. We knew we wanted two levels. The first image that I gave David was this Thomas Aikens picture of the Gross, the Gross Clinic, which now Steven Soderbergh has used, and we all kind of know it from the Nick, but this idea of the operating theater felt like it, uh, it, it established a, a language visually that could be reflective both of parliament and governance, you know, with that publicness, the public versus private was very important for us to try to evidence. Um, the multiple levels to be able to look down to witness history was important. So how can you be in the story and also watching the story? Uh, and we, you know, and it has that feeling sort of, it's gladiatorial as well. So you can create that kind of arena. The, the initial workshop we did that was staged, which was in May of 2014, did not have anything on the ground. So it was all done without those turntables. In the first meeting I had with, with Corins, he said, I really think we should have turntables, maybe a double turntable. And Andy and I said, let's see if we can do it without it, let's see if we can do it without it. And eventually, David made one plea after a very uh, effective workshop, and he said, here's why I think we should do it. And we talked about not just the delivering of furniture, but there's a, there's a larger idea, which is that even when we think we're standing still, time goes on. We're still rotating, we're still you know, barreling through this universe. So there are, there are these opportunities 
to have the inevitability of time reflected. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you know, if you look at the staging very carefully, who moves in a circle, who moves in a straight line, options versus lack of options, that's also something that Andy was, was very mindful of, so we wanted to build an environment where, where that could be um, actualized. And then the final thing is, well, one of the, another thing is, I, I very early on said there's no walls in this set. Mm -hmm. I don't want any walls, nothing slowing this down. We have, we have 46 songs, but we have like, you know, 60 or 70 locations. So if we wanted to give Hal Binkley the opportunity to go from place to place to place, if you look at a song like Right Hand Man or Nonstop, we're in eight different places there, just with the change of a light. So nothing cumbersome that could slow it down. Right. It's interesting, you know, I, I don't know if I told you this e either, but um, when we were um, figuring out the design of the Hamilton book, the thing that I kept hammering every single time we had a design conversation was look at the show, look at, at how fast it moves, look at how little clutter there is, like look, it's, it's unfiltered in a way that it's designed to get you right up in front of the show, in front of the people in it. That is the experience we need to deliver, but we need to do it in a book. And so those like design notes that you were giving, those principles, we translated exactly to the page, or we tried. That's anyway. why I love your book so much. I thought that was it. Uh, over here, is there a hand over here I got, somewhere? I got the microphone. Um, um, I got the mic right here. Oh, great. Stand up maybe so we can see you. Um, so I'm wondering about if you can talk a little bit about the school collaboration and how do yes. the schools get picked and also if there's anything you can share us, with us about the process in terms of the classrooms, what the classroom teachers are engaged These in. These are the great. Curriculum. I've never heard three such good questions to start a Q&A. This is fantastic. Yeah. Um, Chicago. Chicago. Ha <laughs> 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 broad shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> the, what I don't know is how the schools will be selected in the other cities yet. Um, someone might know that, I just don't know that. Uh, I know that the, the chancellor of the New York City Public Schools is very involved with, with finding the schools that are uh, invited to be part of the program. Um, I don't know exactly what the application process is. I've, I've seen the, the, you know, the curriculum that's been created, which is pretty neat. Um, and, and, and a lot of it, you know, I would say, I, I don't know it particularly well. And, and it's also something where it wasn't going to be about the director or the writer going into the classrooms. It needed to be something that was self-sustaining and self-sufficient just with them and their relationship with the teachers. It, but it would seem, what I'm seeing is when they show up, it involves a fair amount of collaboration and teamwork about, about finding voice and articulating an idea. But a lot of, I'd say, more than half of the groups that come up are pairs or trios you know, it's, it's, it's a few people that are working together. Um, so I think a lot of it is also about, uh, you know, just this idea of how we get one idea communicated cleanly, even if it's, it's your idea, but my task is to articulate it. Right. So, you know, that's, that's something that I think has been, you know, pretty, pretty uh, wonderful to see, but, yeah. but I'm pretty outside, I, I'm outside yeah. of it. I, know, I mean, I do know that from, just from the conversations for the book that um, they, the first cut in terms of the eligibility f of the schools is um, the participation in Title I. So it's the, they're, the, they're looking for schools where uh, preponderance of the students probably don't have the means to see shows like Hamilton um, in these big fancy theaters. And I think part of the energy that you feel in the audience is that, um, as David said, um, what's exciting about those student audiences is that they don't know the rules. And so you're getting a, a visceral response. And I mean, my, my sense of, about those audiences is that you're getting every reaction you'd get from a more traditional, you know, sort of paying audience, but just it's higher. So the laughs are bigger, the gasps are louder, the sorrow in the show is, is more poignant because you can hear it. Um, it's the best way to see it. I mean, I've, you know, I've seen the show a million times and the best one by far was the one that was with a bunch of high school students. So is there another mic over here? I, keep see, I see a hand on the aisle right there. Go for it. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering why you chose to direct mainly in Broadway other than TV. And is film. that gonna, well, can I, let me focus that a little. Do you think you're gonna continue looking to Broadway or are you mainly going to be doing screen work now? Uh, no, uh, I mean, you know, my part of the forest is the theater, and um, I will stay there as long as they will have me. Um, you know, I've, I've only done four Broadway shows, so most of the work I've done is at smaller theaters off-Broadway or, you know, just other places in the world, and I think there are certain stories that should be told in the theater, and there are certain stories that should be told um, uh, on different, you know, uh, on different mediums. So it just depends on the project. You know, what I was really proud about with Greece was it was a chance for a lot of people in, in one fell swoop to see the power of theater. That, sh mm -hmm. that whole production was 
celebrating what it means to make something live. And you know, I've been in this uh, sort of complicated scenario where I made something that I that I like very much with Hamilton that is, uh, you know, about all of us and for all of us, and not everybody can see it, and that's that's a challenge. Um, so one of the reasons why I'm trying to be so active in the making of the future companies because more people will see the show in Chicago now than we'll see it in New York. That's just a numbers thing. And then if you think about it, when the show is in San Francisco and then the show is in London, 75% of your audience will be seeing it outside of New York. Yeah. But it just, it takes time to set those things up. So what I liked about that, that opportunity with Greece was it was a way to let a lot of people tune in and, and connect to something. And then it also exists afterward. You can still find it, you can still have it, you can still be around it. And so that's, that's part of the challenge. Uh, yes, I, it's sure, right here. Hi. Um, first of all, kudos to you both because I think it's safe to say that Limon Miranda, although he gets so much credit and he's kind of the front man, um, I think it's amazing how many people have to come together to make these things happen. So thank you to you both. You. Um, and also, kind of a cliche question, but I'm here so I have to ask it. Any advice for aspiring um, performance? Um, <laughs> people and people who want to go into theater, specifically directing, maybe? Yes, and the one thing that I can suggest is you just make as much as you can mm. anywhere. Theater is theater. It's, if it's on a front porch, if it's in a lobby, if it's in a basement, if it's on the street, it's theater. So just make it. That, th you're going you're gonna to find a group of people that can do things you can't do. Um, you're going to find people that like to work in the way that you work. You're going to find people that work in a different way. Make stuff with all of them. See where you fit. See what you can contribute. Mm and get your 10,000 hours, get your 15,000 hours now, because you, you just, just let, the, let the making of it be enough. That's, that's the only thing that you really can control. You don't know when someone's gonna hire you. It's very difficult to be hired as a director in your 20s, and that's a pretty big part of your life. So don't wait for them. Just go and make. Somebody tweet that. I want to read it later. That was really good. <laughs> I want to have that like on uh, up for my own life. Like, about, but um, but that was another great yeah, question. Yeah, Jeremy, Thank you. do more. <laughs> right uh, over here, maybe. Yeah, I, yeah, I've got I've got the mic now. Can you stand up? We just sure. really can't see you from up here. Hi. Hi. Um, I wanted to know if there were other productions. You know, while you're creating this, other things you have your ear to the ground and say like that's the type of thing I want to do or. If there are things that you say, that's absolutely not at all what we're going to do. Other productions that were going on that influenced uh, the creation of this. Oh, yes, we were incredibly influenced. I mean, you know, a lot of them are things that have existed for a long time. And we sort of often said that the, the grandparents of the show were Gypsy and Sweeney Todd, two stories about monsters. Um, <laughs> you'll hear a lot of Sweeney in our show, if you, if you know Sweeney. Um, you know, those were really significant. Jesus Christ Superstar, Evita. Uh, Les Mis is the grandma that raised us that was not related to us. <laughs> um, uh, um, oh, good, some Heights fans. I got you. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to take care of everybody. Um, you know, and then, and like I said, and, you know, The Matrix was a moment. You know, so like, we also, it was, a, it was something that was both a love letter to theater and to the things in the world that moved us to, you know, to artists that, uh, that, were, that were making things, music that, that, that felt like it could be um, uh, nodded to or acknowledged in a way. And, 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 and also, like, you know, if you look back like at the really early forms, right, like, and this is not saying that this is Shakespeare, but Shakespeare had a prologue where he tell you what the story was. There's a prologue in our show. It lets your ear sort of dial in. And then the story starts when Burr meets Hamilton. You can start the story right there. But, you know, so there were those kinds of things all over the place, as well as just, you know, the, the people making stuff over the last 10 or 15 years in New York that we were lucky enough to, to sit and, and be patrons of and, and consume in that way. We've got time for a couple more. Over here? Yes. Thank you. Um, I got to see the first performance of the uh, show here in Chicago, oh, and great. it sure didn't feel like a preview. It felt like, you know, the real deal, so good luck with that. Thank you. Um, there's two things. I was standing waiting for the doors to open, and a young girl just started singing, you yeah. know, my shot. And then uh, an elderly woman walked over and joined in, and then a middle-aged <laughs> man, and then a couple of other kids. And so there we are on the sidewalk, and we're having this show. And the energy that just started out there was extraordinary, and the whole night was like that. 
But I was fascinated by your talk about the choreography, and I want to ask you about the lighting. I was so moved by the lighting, which changed everything and made it a whole, uh, every scene was different based on that lighting. Hal Binkley is an artist. He's a, I don't know how else to describe it, but Hal and I have done six or seven shows together. He was someone that I met, my first show was Heights, and you know, Hal lit Kiss of the Spider Woman. You know, I mean like mm -hmm. Hal has been doing some things. Um, <laughs> and what I love about theater is my first Broadway show was his 35th. And there we were, right? There, there I was parked right next to him, just being like, hey, what if we, and he's like, I got you, buddy, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really full collaboration with the set designer as well, um, with, with Andy, and it's just lots of conversations, and it's also getting out of the way. Hal needs to go and do his work, and I'm not, you know, when Lynn writes something, I'm not sitting there asking him about each line before he erases it. So, he'll, he'll let me know when there's something for me to see, and so I, I try to also give that space but to him. But there's this pattern, all your designers the, the actors, for the most part, are younger than you. The designers, for the most part, have been around longer. They have much more experience. Was that intentional going in? Like, you, do you seek out the collaborators who have, you know, more notches on their belts from the productions that well, they've done? Well, inherently, designers work more often than directors. A designer right. can do four or five shows a year. When Sorry. I'm not going, so. They're, I mean, just put it, they're older than you. Oh my God, Jeremy. <laughs> I mean, I don't like to less say Less and less, it, interestingly. But, right? Um, but, uh, they, but you have not gone to like the hot new person coming up who's gonna do the thing. You went with the trusted veteran. Well, I, I go with the person that I think is right for the show. And okay. this was a design team in its whole that I'd done three or four shows with, and then on some of them I'd done even more. And it okay. just, uh, so it had been forged on other shows, some shows that none of you guys have ever heard of, but we figured something out there. We, we yeah. understood how to communicate, and yeah. um, it just made, made sense. It. Maybe time for one more from each mic. Uh, yes, go ahead. Hi. Um, a lot of the questions have been about different influences. I know a huge influence or a big part of the show is the hip hop influence, correct? So, yeah. and I've read that a lot of contemporary hip hop artists have come to experience the show. So I was wondering if either of you could share any stories about reaction that you received from those artists. And also if you had any information or had heard any of the um, uh, tracks that are coming out on oh, the new I mean, you've heard all I tape. assume you've heard every note of it at this point. I've, I've heard most of the mixtape, if not all of it. There might be one or two that I haven't. Have you heard any of it? Some of it, yeah. Um, yeah, get ready, y'all. <laughs> um, it's, it's like beyond, like, you, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, and when Jeremy was making the book with Lynn, when Alex Lacamoire and The Roots and Bill Sherman were making that album with Lynn, what, the one thing I said to, you know, to each of those groups, because I, my involvement with them was, quite different than making the show is, you're not making the show. So go and make the, the best cast album you can that will stand on its own as a cast album. That is not the show. That is how people have access to the show and I can't wait for them to have it, but don't feel burdened by this other thing. Same with the book. I think the mixtape is going to be evidence of that also. It is its own thing. Um, yeah. I have one quick hip hop story which I can mm. tell. Um, you know, I, I always say that um, being at Hamilton was, uh, early on especially, when people were just finding the show, David called it um, People Mad Libs. You were like, who was there? Um, for, for me, it was, I, I sort of thought, only on the internet would these three things be next to each other. Um, and there was an early preview we had, and it, there were, when we were still working early on down at the public, and it was Salman Rushdie, Mandy Patinkin, and Buster Rhymes. <laughs> um, Right, like that's the end of the joke. No, right. I mean, that's the bit. And, and I, was, I was walking back and Buster Rhymes, you know, there's a line that got changed, but the, the rise up is very, you know, <laughs> is very much, you know, an acknowledgement of Buster Rhymes um, in our show. And so I was walking backstage uh, and Buster was there with one of his friends um, who I knew a little bit and I, I was gonna bring them back to the green room to meet Lynn and the rest of the cast. And I don't like wear Hamilton swag, and I'm not like, guess who directed it? <laughs> um, so, so I'm just like kind of walking him back, and then somehow he finds out that I directed the show, and he was like, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> and he stopped me and like stood right in front of me for a few minutes and talked about the king and the costume of the king. 
And he was like, yo, you changed everything with that. <laughs> and, he said, and he had a concert the next day for the Bad Boy 20th reunion. You heard me. Um, and he said he called his guy um, at intermission and was like, I want a Louis Vuitton 30 feet long. <laughs> and he walked out in a robe the next day, 30 feet long. And I was like, and scene. Yeah. <laughs> this has been really fascinating listening to you tonight. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Thank you guys.